Uh, we'll be uh, looking at Revelation chapter 19. Revelation uh, chapter 19. And we're going to begin reading in verse 11. Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse 11. The Bible says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. <coughs> and he was clothed with a, vest a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty, and he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and cried with a loud voice, saying, To all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come, gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for another opportunity to stand behind the pulpit tonight and look into your word. We praise you for your word, uh, for its uh, encouragement down through the years to us and gives us stability where there seems to be none. God, we pray tonight that you would bless this word to the hearts of the hearer. Lord, make us encouraged in what lies ahead. And we be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, fairly familiar verses of Scripture, I think sometimes they're a bit taken out of text. But if you will follow the streamline of the revelation, uh, it, is, it is the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is Him uh, coming down to take back what is his. And you'll be one or two places by this point. Uh, well, I guess either way, you'll be in glory if you're among the redeemed. It'll be the catching away of God's redeemed. It'll be seven years after that. And if you die in the flesh, you'll also already be there. So with this group of elect, He's returning to uh, reclaim what, he, what, what, he, what was his. Now, if you know your Bible, he lost it uh, some 6,000 6, years ago when Adam fell in the garden. And at any time, he could have reclaimed it. But what, what the difference is, and that, you know, that's what I've heard trashed and messed up about this part. The reason that he did it on this uh, wise was to, to bring glory to himself. He could have reclaimed it any time he wanted to. At the, at the simple thought in his mind, he could have reestablished Jerusalem. But to get the most glory to himself and bring the heathen to himself, he chose to do it this way. And it, and it brings great glory and honor to him uh, when, when we think about the, the amazing coming of Christ. You know, you don't hear about that much anymore, do you? About the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and how quickly it could uh, occur. You know how quickly it'll occur? I don't know when, but I do know how quickly in, in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, it will it will come to pass, and we'll be home with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, going back to our text, uh, I want to go to verse nine. Go back to verse nine, and speaking of the angel, and in verse nine he says, "And he saith unto me, Write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb." And, and he and he saith unto me, 
These are true, the true sayings of God. Now, I want you to see, first of all, that before we have any hope of seeing this miraculous event, make your calling and election true. He says, blessed and holy that are called. Uh, you know, what a precious, wonderful gift that he called us unto himself because he didn't have to. He did it for his own. He did it for the people that belonged to him. He called them to himself. Now, very quickly, just to uh, get a little precursor, and we'll go back, I want you to see in verse 1, uh, in the first verse of uh, chapter 19, and after these things, and the after of those things, uh, was a, a judgment on the great city Babylon, a, tri a type of the Catholic Church in chapter 18. It is judged forevermore. And then I want you to see the re response is this. Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Uh, have you ever been tempted to do that? You know, when you see a victorious thing occur, that will be your first uh, impulse is to give the Lord God the great glory that's due His name. When your children are saved, when you see divine healing, those things, you know what? He deserves credit for. Here in 18, He cast away sin forever. I can't even imagine that. I mean, I'm serious. I can't imagine sin being no more. You know, our president today uh, uh, dispatched 10,000 more troops uh, to Russia. And they're meeting in uh, Germany tonight to discuss a worldwide attack on Russia. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, things could get really interesting, could they not? Uh, but you know what we ought to be saying to that? Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise be his name. You know, if it takes us one step closer to glory, then certainly we should, uh, uh, we, we should be excited. We should be glad and praise his name. Notice he says in verse 2, and this we will do in glory, and we can't always do it now. For true and righteous are his judgments. Now, certainly we can say that God, God's judgments are always right, but we can't necessarily always do it in the flesh. Uh, I remember the last years of Brother Down's life trying to talk to him on the phone, and he would just be here and there, and, uh, you know, I, I truly said to him, you know, such a valiant servant of the Lord, it was so hard for me to understand him going that way. We talked privately many, many times, and when his brother had Alzheimer's, that was his biggest fear. That was his biggest fear, and you know what? He faced it. Uh, I'm like, where, you know, in the flesh, you'll say, where's the fairness in that? When what we really should be saying is, hallelujah. Hallelujah! And, and so when this great judgment of the great whore is cast upon us, the immediate spiritual response, because remember, these are people in glory already, was to give him great praise for it. Verse 2, it discusses the judgment of the whore, and particularly at the bottom, uh, avenged for the blood of his servants. Now, listen, you can go back, if you will, uh, you can get Fox's Book of Martyrs and, and look back on the time when the Catholic Church openly killed people that believe what we believe. Mm -hmm. uh, bloody, horrible, horrible deaths. Not just cutting their head off and being done with it, but, but abject torture. And so now she's under... She's been the one that judged, and, and God's people are saying, hallelujah. You know, uh, sometimes it's hard to, hard to look at false doctrine as evil as it really is, because we have nice, good friends caught up in the middle of it. But you know what? It's an evil, evil device. It, it gives you a false sense of security. And so in... In the part, in the time without the flesh, then certainly we can say glory, hallelujah, 
Blessed be his name, he's judged her. It's done. Now notice the response of worship in verse 4. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Now, amen, and sometimes we, we don't think about the meaning of it. We say amen, and what you're really saying is, I agree. <laughs> Absolutely. You, you got it right. And uh, so we find in, in this glorified body that we'll have, we, cannot, we can agree with everything God does. Amen. That's setting the flesh aside, is it not? You can't do it now, but certainly we'll be able to do it then. And so we see this, uh, this festival of praise simply because the judgment of God. Verse 5, And the voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye, and ye that fear him, both small and great. I want you to see in the midst of the judgment, what God expected was praise. You know what he expects from you tonight? Praise. Mm -hmm. Always has. Always will. Now, uh, we shortchange him a whole lot, but that's his anticipation for those entities that are created for his glory is praise. Uh, you know why Lucifer failed? Because he wasn't praising. He thought he was just as good as God. What was Lucifer created for? To glorify God. And he missed the mark. And, and many times uh, we do the exact same thing. We don't praise him nearly as we should. And the end result is being cold and indifferent to the things of God. Verse 6, And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, as the voice of many waters, as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Now, I want you to see here, they give him great glory and praise and honor in many languages and many ways to say it. And they title him this, what he's always been, the Lord God omnipotent, all-powerful. Everything belonging to him, he reigneth. You know, uh, it takes a long time in your life to come to that conclusion, does it not? <coughs> that even a bug hitting your windshield when you're going across the Dover Bridge was ordained and authored by God. <laughs> that, that, that's just unbelievable to me, is it not? But certainly it is. And, and, and we throw all those things aside to happenstance and just the way it was and I was in the right place at the right time. No, no, no. God is omnipotent and that is whom he should be worshipped for. Nothing less than being all-powerful, sovereign, everything under his feet. You know, I really think that was the Jesus walking on the water was to show that everything is under his feet. Everything is under his authority. Verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor unto him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. Now, uh, I've often thought about this, and th this may be going out of, on, on, a, on a limb here, but I believe that's what the seven years are about. Now, the bride preparing herself. Because by that point, if I understand the Bible correct, we will have been in glory for seven years, and everybody up there is redeemed. Now, I don't think everybody's in the bride. I, I don't believe that. But the ones that are, are making things ready. Get, and, 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 you know, uh, um, huh, it, it's hard to... It, it, it's hard to put your mind around that event happening like it says it will. Uh, uh, I remember the day Don and I married. Uh, there's one good picture. Uh, so our, our, our pictures were junk because the best photographer, Lynn, was in the wedding. So she couldn't take pictures and be in the wedding at the same time. 
But there's one really, really good picture of Donna that Lynn made outside the building. And she has her bouquet and she has her veil on and uh, uh, she made herself ready, just beautiful. And that's what the bride will be doing in glory. Now, if Donna did that, and yeah, I'm assuming she didn't get up with the chickens that morning, I don't know, but maybe got ready in four or five hours. Think about what the, the bride of Christ can do in seven years. It will be breathtaking. It will it, be unreal. And, and, and so we find that uh, they're, they're very excited about it. Verse 8 and to her was granted or given that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now, what, why, what is the problem today that we can't wear that? What will be the difference between now and then? Well, I can tell you the key difference is this. This flesh will finally be put away. And then you can wear the garment fine and clean. You can wear, you can wear the garment that your spirit man already wears. You can, you can uh, be the most, uh, the most wonderful display of God's glory that ever has been. You know, that should be the real drive of a person of God. A redeemed vessel is to glory by God. But now what will happen as long as we're here and we're in this situation, the flesh will get in the way, but there we do not have that hindrance. Right. There we do not have that trouble Man. and we'll be ready to glorify him. So to these individuals, special attention was given. And he saith unto me, write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now we have another group here, the first being the bride, and he says, blessed are they that are called, that gets an invite, N not the bride herself, uh, <laughs> just redeemed. You know, Blessed be God that he placed me in one of his churches, but still blessed be the name of God if all he ever did for me on my behalf was save my dear never dying soul. I'd be glad to be a guest. Yeah. It, it would be a wonderful thing just to show up for that. And, and so we see he has the bride arrayed in white and fine linen, and then he says, Blessed are those that are called to come and he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now in the modern day, what we find is more and more is this, is that this is being belittled down to nothing more than a story. It, it, it's just figurative. That's, that's the words they like to use. But I don't believe that. I believe it'll be as much as like a marriage supper as you can think of. And if we were Jewish, you know what? I think we could understand it even better, don't you? And if we knew how the festivities of a wedding in that culture had occurred, uh, we would even say it more. Verse 10, he wants to uh, 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 worship the angel. And he says, uh, he says, don't do it. Uh, he said, worship God. Worship God. Verse 11, back to our text. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. Now, two of our greatest aspects, two of our greatest char characteristics of the Almighty found there, and he's called Faithful and True. When you think nothing's left, there's no options, our God is being faithful. Yeah. Um, man, we get tore up when the cupboard's bare, don't we? Yeah. But even then, when all you got is mac and cheese, you know what? Our God's been faithful. 
And I'll go one deeper that's going to be harder to understand, but we may see it when there ain't no mac and cheese. He's still faithful. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, look that, we look at that in way too much of a carnal sense, but blessed be the name of God, when I face death or the catching away, when I face death, he's going to be faithful and true. He, he's going to be true and faithful to me. And he's described here in just that way. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. Now, I spend way too much time on Facebook, and I know none of y'all do that, but I do. And uh, uh, you know what? People are judging all the time on there. You seen that just, just trash each other out. You know what? They, they go around and name calling and stuff, but they have no right to judge. You know, uh, uh, I had this explanation to me in, um, when I was in nursing school, and I always, it always stuck with me. How do I know this church, this shirt is red? I've always been taught that this is red from my book. But have you ever thought maybe what Sister Diane sees is red? It's totally different than what I, but she's always taught that that was red, so she calls it red too. And that's kind of about like judgment is. It's your own perception, is it not? It's what you think. You have no right to, to throw off judgment. That belongs to the Almighty. And, and, and so we see then, <laughs> as the writer <laughs> John records these events, he says the one that has the judging ability is going to do it. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Now, I really believe that the reason he's described this way is he sees through the dark. What we think we hid and what we think we put aside, God sees it as clear as day. And he understands what's going on. He, he, he knows what's <coughs> trying to be hid. He is a very wonderful, true judge. And on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Now, uh, the many crowns means full authority. If there was a crown of the United States, and there's not, he'd have that crown. You know what? Queen Elizabeth II won't always wear that crown. It belongs to God. And in the most heathen nation you can think of in the Middle East, you know what? God's still God. And that belongs to him as much as Israel does. And he will get it back. All those crowns is his authority over the filth of this world, over the, the present place that we're in. It belongs to him. Verse 13, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. You, you, you want to know more about the Almighty? Get covered up with this. You dig in here as deep as you can get. You understand the truth that's in this book. And when you think you've got it all, study it again. That's, that, that, that is studying the very, the very essence of whom God is. And the armies which were in heaven, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So uh, this is what you're going to be doing. And sometimes we and Christians think that we're the only ones that's going to be there, but since in glory the Bible says there will be na neither male nor female, ladies, you'll be with us, We'll be coming out against the very oppressor that we've always knew, and since we've been saved, have always despised, that will be the one that we get to conquer, help conquer. You know, what a, what a glorious thought that is, that uh, he'll have no opposition. And, 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 you know what, and the Bible says he'll come through there, and the blood will, want, will run as deep as a horse's cry. And uh, all, his, all has to happen is his presence be there. Uh, he's not coming back as a little lamb the next time. 
You know, uh, that's one thing I don't like about images. Jesus on the cross makes me sick, literally. Uh, he hasn't been on the cross in some 2,000 years. The long-haired Jesus is a Catholic myth. Uh, and, and what I like to be think about when this feeble mind can, and I don't even know what looks are, is I know that he's sitting at the right hand of the Almighty. And that's, that's all I need to know. But as he's coming down with us all flanked out on each side to destroy sin forevermore. You want to know what the problem is with your body? Sin. You know what the, kind of the problem is with your spirit? Sin. You know what the problem is uh, that hinders us every day? It's just sin. And, and this in this action, all would be defeated. Verse 15. And, his, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with it that he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, I want you to see that he will wreak judgment on the governments of this world. Now, uh, you think, well, the United States uh, has been pretty good. Well, first of all, you got yourself duped. It hasn't been pretty good. And, and can you imagine just this one nation, how much the judgment of God just for abortion. That one thing alone, the entire nation will be judged uh, heartily and deserve whatever God dips out. And I also want you to see the next thing, that he's going to come as Almighty God. In other words, you know, when he came the first time, he came to provide uh, the sinless sacrifice, but when he comes again, he's going to mete out judgment and he's going to mete out punishment and all the same person like the Almighty God. See, that's the venue he's coming, is to judge this filthy, ungodly world and set up a real kingdom at the nation of Israel. It says he'll rule with an with a, with a iron. Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, that's, you know what that really means? Cutting nobody any slack. Y'all remember when we had Governor Ray Blanton back in the 70s? And toward the end of his term, he got to selling off pardons from the prison. Uh, man, that's corrupt, ain't it? About, that's just about as low down as you can get. That's not the judgment of the Almighty. You know what? Uh, you know what God will deal? He may, he'll meet out punishment. When some people that have healed, they'll give their life for it. That, that, that is just and true judgment. And so we find in, in this economy, in, in this government, it will be completely right. Verse 16, and he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lords of Lords, right here, identifying who he is. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Now, you know what's on the menu that night? Sinners. <laughs> you know what's on the menu that night? Vessels of wrath. <laughs> You don't want to be there. When pure judgment flows from the throne, you do not want to be there. Amen. From the very first sin in the garden, Adam deserved death. And he was given, he was given a sacrifice. See, that part of God is gone. And he's going to beat out judgment just, just like it's supposed to be. Uh, friends, you don't want to be there. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ. He's your only, only, only hope tonight yeah. is to put everything you have in him. He's a savior, kind and true. He's a dear, dear friend. Trust him. <coughs> so we'll, huh, 
You'll be in the party that's coming and not in the party that's being judged. <laughs> right. That's that's where we need to be tonight. Right. 